Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, and once again, welcome to the RW250 book group uh, for today. Thank you for joining us rather for today's discussion of Nathaniel Philbrick's Valiant Ambition. Uh, before I turn it over to our host for today, Dr. Michael Crowder, who is the ITPS, that's the Institute for Thomas Paine Studies at Iona College. Uh, he's our public historian. Uh, I just wanna do a few brief introductions and a couple of um, logistics for today's conversation. Uh, this again, this, this conversation is, is, is a joint effort between the ITPS and the wonderful folks, uh, Connie Kehoe in particular at RW250. So a brief, for anyone who's just joining us today, I know we have a few Iona students um, who, are, who are just here for the first time. I'm, I'm gonna be dropping the link to RW250 Westchester in the chat, and you can also feel free to sign up for their newsletter and get involved with many of the wonderful activities they are, they are um, spearheading. Um, I will also drop in the chat um, a link to the ITPS website along with our newsletter and some registration information. I'm sure we'll have many collaborations to come, um, but that can get you caught up to speed about some of those, those materials. Uh, uh, Connie Kehoe's biography is quite lengthy, so I will, I will keep it, uh, I'm very impressive, so I'll keep it brief, but she is an, an alumna of Vassar College and also has a master's in teaching from Wesleyan University. She is the force behind, um, and I'm only going to try to say this once because we know it's a very difficult word, the, the semi-sesquicentennial, we'll just say the 250th, <laughs> uh, of Rev, Rev 250 in the Westchester and Hudson Valley areas. She is also involved with New York State historian Devin Lander at the statewide commissions, um, a commission that, or a working group, I should say, that both myself and Michael are also involved in. Um, Michael is also involved in RW250, and he, amongst the many things that he has on his CV, he has a PhD in early American history where he specializes not only in the history of anti-slavery and the American Revolution, but is also working on what's sure to be a fantastic biography of Thomas Paine. So that brings us with the with the framing, a few notes on logistics. As I said before, this session is being recorded, um, which means I will pin both Michael and Connie's profiles so that you will see them alternating between whoever else is speaking. Um, Michael will provide some more details about how the conversation will go in terms of hand raising and chats. But as folks join the room, I will give you the option to be, quote, promoted to a panelist. This does not oblige you to speak in any way, but rather if you would feel more comfortable with your camera on or having the option to turn your camera on, that's what this gives you. If you don't want to have your camera, then I'm just going to enable your microphone and you'll be able to, to chime in um, uh, that way instead. So I think that covers um, covers that portion. Oh, I would also ask that, of course, if you're not speaking, if you would be so kind as to keep your, your microphone on mute, so that way it doesn't distract the camera or the Zoom. So without further ado, I turn it over to, to Michael and to Connie. All right, should I go next or Michael? <laughs> uh, you go right ahead, Connie. All right, well, uh, Nora, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and I am so looking forward to the discussion and very grateful that Dr. Michael Crowder has agreed to moderate, lead, give his opinion, interact with all of us uh, in this book discussion. Um, I also mentioned that so much of RW250 is run by volunteers, and so it is with this book discussion group. Uh, some folks I'll mention, uh, Andrew Scott and Dick Forliano, both have had input into the book that was chosen and have been some of the people driving this particular activity of RW250. Those of you who have never been part of any of our programs or events, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we, uh, we do a variety of things. We promote a variety of activities and uh, try to serve the needs of various aspects of the public, whether they're young families who are slightly interested in history or history PhDs, we, we want to keep everybody involved in this upcoming revolutionary uh, semi-quincentennial, as Nora well said, that seven syllable word. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to um, really throw it over to, to Michael to, uh, to start us off. I would just say I am so looking forward to 
a diversity of ideas that uh, I'm sure this book has stimulated. I have some, but I will just be one of, one of many voices uh, to chime in. I think this will be about an hour. Um, and if you have any difficulties with something technical, I'm sure putting it in the chat, Nora will probably take notice and uh, help you out. So with that, I'm throwing it over to Michael. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Connie. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, thank you, Nora, for the introductions. Uh, thank you, everybody uh, with us today. We have a fantastic turnout. We have more than 40 folks here uh, for a Sunday afternoon matinee discussion, uh, hour long discussion of uh, this book. Um, and before I make my brief comments, I'll just say a few things, hopefully to get get the conversation started. and and. Uh, ask a couple of questions that uh, you might want to think about uh, as we spend this uh, hour together. Uh, just a couple of things about commenting, and, and Nora already uh, covered some of this ground, but uh, just to reiterate, uh, if you have accepted uh, being a co-panelist, that means that if you would like to ask a question, uh, you can do so by, uh, I'll uh, uh, point to you, virtually point to you, uh, and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, you're also welcome to uh, uh, make your video uh, viewable for us so we can see you ask the question and, and that's uh, 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 up to you. Um, uh, you can either ask or uh, be seen and ask. Uh, you can also use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of the screen too and I'll, I'll monitor the Q&A uh, on a sidebar and try to address questions from, for those who want to type in their questions. Uh, and so um, just a few thoughts about this book and, and uh, I just want to start out by saying that in doing my PhD, um, the, the most fun part of getting a PhD actually was book groups as part of multiple book groups. So this is kind of throwing me back to the best part of uh, training in this time period. And I do write about this time period, uh, the American Revolution. Um, and the first thing I want to say is that I, I really, really genuinely enjoyed reading this book. Uh, I Like many of his books, uh, Mayflower comes out, uh, pops into my head in Bunker Hill. It's a, it's a snappy narrative that's quite engaging. Uh, but I do have a couple of questions uh, and comments just to sort of get us thinking about uh, some of the sort of broader topics that this book touches upon. Um, and with all books that uh, cover this time period, whether it's the politics uh, of the revolutionary era or as is uh, the case in Valiant Ambition, the, the military history, uh, of the American War for Independence, the, the very first question I find myself asking myself uh, is uh, how does this book uh, either reflect uh, or challenge uh, or something in between uh, prevailing sort of popular historical narratives uh, of the American Revolution, again, be it the military history of the American Revolution or popular historical narratives of individuals uh, uh, prominent in uh, the American Revolutionary era, like, for example, George Washington and Benedict Arnold, two names that don't need much of an introduction uh, in many ways, uh, uh, even to, to 21st century Americans that uh, aren't particularly familiar with the 18th century. Those are two names that uh, are likely to be to be known. Uh, but how does this book, uh, or does it reflect, or does it challenge prevailing popular historical narratives, historical memory uh, of this time period? Uh, a sort of related question as well that I, I found myself uh, thinking about uh, as I was reading this book is, uh, why pair uh, George Washington and Benedict Arnold together in a book like this. Because uh, as we read the book, uh, what becomes pretty clear is that George Washington and Benedict Arnold, in fact, did not have uh, much personal contact at all uh, in the course of the American War for Independence or before the American War for Independence, largely as a function of their various duties. They were very rarely in the same geographical place together at the same time. So why pair these two together? And what does that tell us about the way that Nathaniel Philbrick is approaching uh, writing a history of the American, the war that was the American founding moment? 
And another question, and, and this is, Connie, this is a local question for you and for, for us Westchester denizens or people who are Westchester adjacent, adjacent denizens. Uh, how do you think, and, and, and this is something I'm really uh, curious to hear your, your own thoughts on this. Uh, how, how do you think this book uh, reflects the history of Westchester in this really crucial time period, of course, this crucial time period uh, that ultimately we know led to the achievement of an independent United States, but that was an outcome which was unclear and very contested uh, until a time period after this book covers. This book ends, interestingly enough, in 1780 and 1781. It doesn't end with the formal end of the war. Mm -hmm. And that's another sort of sub-question we might think about. Why end then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are my initial thoughts. And we, we have about 48 minutes, 49 minutes uh, open for discussion. I wanted to keep my thoughts brief, uh, but I hope those questions uh, sort of get the discussion rolling, get the ball rolling, if, if, if you will, uh, as ways of sort of, or entering points maybe as a way to think about uh, uh, the American Revolution uh, in the 21st century. Uh, and so as I suggested, and as Nora suggested, if you want to unmute yourself, please do. Uh, I'm, I, I'm just gonna ask everybody to use the hand raise function. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can find that at the bottom of the screen uh, on the, the right hand side of the taskbar. Uh, that'll just allow me to keep track of who's asking questions in what order, because we have thankfully quite a few people joining us today. So if you'll just raise your hand, uh, I'll keep track. Uh, if you want to ask your question, um, uh, if you want to type your question, you're free to drop that in the Q&A at any time and I'll monitor that and I'll come back to it uh, periodically. Uh, so I see many hands and this is fantastic. Uh, and so the first hand that I, that I saw, uh, Andrew Scott, um, and uh, then Donald and then Paul, just so that we have a little bit of sense of order. So Andrew and then Donald and then uh, Paul, but Andrew, please uh, jump right in. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm uh, Andrew Scott. I'm a history teacher at uh, Pell Memorial High School. Um, just to lead off on that question of, of why pairing these two together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it also, in some ways, goes back to your original question about, um, you know, uh, prevailing ideas or, or myths, you might say, about, about these different figures. I, I think one of the reasons why... Um, the author chose to pair these two is because when you look at them in a broad sense, you see two men who have very different natural abilities as a military man, and two men who have very different understandings of what the revolution um, yeah. can be. So uh, George Washington, and I think that also goes to prevailing thoughts, was not a natural military man. And I think uh, Philbrick a couple of times talks about his his military uh, background, and I had an issue with that. He doesn't he doesn't really have a professional military background, and that comes across. Um, he is not uh, he he has a tendency not George Washington has a tendency not to see multiple lines of attack. He he tends to get very fixated on one thing, and uh, professional military men like Howe can move around them, and and Washington sort of left in in, in a in a bit of a frenzy there. Uh, Benedict Arnold, I think, had a more natural, innate ability to read a battlefield and to understand what could be done. Um, so that's where they're different. Um, the other point in which they're different is how what they see the revolution being about. I think um, it, it seems pretty, cl pretty clear that uh, Benedict Arnold saw the revolution as an opportunity for personal advancement. Um, more so than I would have thought going into, I mean, I, I thought I knew a bit of the story of, of Benedict Arnold, but I think this book was more eye-opening about how, um, to maybe use the phrase craven he is about all of this, you know? And, and Washington, I think, on, on the other hand, seems to be sacrificing himself continuously for a much greater good. So anyway, that's my thoughts about why he pairs these two together. Yeah, th thanks, Andrew. I mean, those are really good points. And I think, you know, you you t you touch on what um, some of the, the uh, what to me is sort of the the, the central theme of the book, um, and we can talk about this more and then some of the details. But 
you know, uh, what's interesting is the way that he frames, he being Philbrick, the way that he frames the sort of characters, uh, abilities and personalities of both Benedict Arnold and George Washington leads you to believe that he sees them to be the inverse of each other, right? As if there's a yin and a yang, right? The one is impetuous, but brave and daring on the battlefield, right? Benedict Arnold, the other, not so much, George Washington. You know, one of the things that's interesting is that uh, I think there's a little bit uh, of a sense in which Philbert kind of challenges the notion of, I, I think the sort of general popular idea that George Washington was, well, George Washington, which means he was brave and heroic and infallible and the first president. Um, and he never chopped down a cherry tree and all those sort of you know, myths about him, right? Because the, the George Washington in this book, which really reflects the way that scholars see him now uh, is uh, kind of all over the place, <laughs> decision-making wise. Uh, he's sort of whipsawing back and forth between aggression uh, and caution and not always making the right decision. Um, and, and in that way, uh, I think it's interesting that Washington is much more flawed than I think most folks would, 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 would sort of reflexively think that he was. Um, so thanks, Andrew, very much. Uh, next on my list, I had uh, Donald and then Paul. So we'll, we'll go in that order. Uh, Donald, if you wanted to go and ask your question. Okay, well, we'll go, Donald, if you want to come back to it. Uh, but Paul, uh, since you're here, uh, I still see your hand. You go ahead, please. Oh, all right. Uh, I guess the way Andrew said it, I, I've taught history, oddly enough, at Iona. Oh. Jim Carroll would know me if uh, Michael gave me a chance to speak to him. He'll probably say, oh, my God, you let him in the room. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, absolutely. But I was an adjunct professor, and I've taught history at the Maritime Academy, Fort Schuyler, and at Hofstra on occasion. I've done a bunch of other things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Andrew, I'd say one difference with George Washington. He did have professional training. I was a professional military man. I was a Marine officer. Uh, combat commands in Vietnam. And then they kept kicking me upstairs to where I worked for a three-star general commanding all Marines in the Pacific, whose boss commanded everything in the Pacific. Uh, and then with a special strategy group with a top secret clearance. Uh, Washington did have professional military things by observation. The French and Indian War, he saw the way the British comported themselves and the foolishness of some of the stuff um, in a war that he actually helped start. And that, that's the, the thing where he went out that Dinwiddie sent him out to tell the French to abandon the Monongahela and uh, Allegheny Rivers where the Ohio began. And Washington led on one of the things that he, I think was a problem where, where I see him tied in with, I'm coming to why they juxtapose the two. Washington was a very aggressive guy. He was unbelievably aggressive. He was so aggressive and so stupid as a 20 some odd year old major that he allowed the Seneca half king who was his guide to convince him to shoot the French who were coming out to parley. And then he allowed himself to sign a thing in French saying, je suis la l'assassin de l'ambassadeur français. I'm the murderer of that document went to the King, King George II, which the French ambassador came in and said, your majesty, look at the city of New York. And Washington had a commission in the Virginia militia. He desperately wanted to have a commission in the, in the uh, regular army. Uh, he did study things. He was very self-taught. He never got, he was not as people think a well-to-do man. His father died when he was a kid, never finished schooling. Uh, you know, grew up on the banks of the Rappahannock across from Fredericksburg and latched on to the Fairfaxes as sponsors to help him get, get up. He read and he tried to improve himself, uh, but he was a very, very aggressive individual. Uh, he was not much of a tactician. I would say he was a very good strategist in that he said the war aim is simply to maintain an army in the field. If we do that long enough, as much as people over here are getting annoyed, the people over there are getting annoyed. And as Edmund Burke, the Irishman who was the member for Parliament in Bristol said, an island cannot conquer a continent, cannot rule a continent. Benedict Arnold was also very aggressive. Uh, 
and he charged off and very impetuous. Washington was sort of impetuous. Arnold had a hell of a temper. Washington had an unbelievably horrible temper. I mean, we blew his stack. People got excited. They said, oh my God, let's get out of here. Philbrick talks about, which I think if anyone's read it, after Kipps Bay, he blew his, he blew his lid. He, blew, he just blew it. He was getting off his horse, throwing his hat on the ground, jumping on it, cursing a blue streak or red streak or whatever you want. And the British were approaching. And if he didn't have his personal slave, William Lee, who was considered next to George Washington, the best horseman in the colonies, saying, uh, General, I think we better get out of here. Those fellows in the red suits don't particularly want us here and they're going to do something. And they got him out of there. He calmed down and tried to create a, realized he couldn't take an offensive battle. So he got to Harlem Heights and did what an intelligent military man would do. Dig in so your fellows aren't out in the open field. Let them attack me. And that's always the advantage, unless the other guy has overwhelming odds, to the defense. And he started doing that. Then he withdrew across, as we know, the <clears throat> jerseys, ultimately winding up in a counterattack at Trenton, all the while steaming over how can he get at these guys. But he had the common sense and the judgment not to do it. On the other hand, you had Benedict Arnold. This is juxt juxt juxtaposing the two of them. Uh, Arnold would impetuously throw himself into things. He had no military training, none whatsoever. He had enough sense to think, figure out some of these things needed to be done. The Kennebec thing all the way up to uh, Quebec. Uh, he was very brave. Uh, he would go foolhardishly brave. He had a lot of tactical sense at Valcour Island, which I would suggest really saved the revolution, the War of Independence. So the British couldn't get down to Ticonderoga and go down, down further in 1776. Um, but I think what Philbrick has done is juxtapose two fellows, both of whom were, were uh, <clears throat> volatile to a large sense, and both of whom were innately very aggressive. Washington had the self-control to channel that aggression, think beyond tomorrow. Arnold, I don't think did, he was smart, uh, but he was foolhardily brave. Another guy that comes to mind who was foolhardily brave was George Custer. He managed to wipe out a third of his own battalion, including himself. Bravery without judgment is not too good. No. And Arnold just let the bravery take over and run at it. And I think no. Philbrick just points these two together. The other bit is Washington was probably fed up at some occasions and determined to stay with it. When Arnold got fed up, he, he started looking for fall guys and blaming it on other people. And that led to what we know as the bad stuff. I think that's why, it's my opinion, that's why he juxtaposed the two of them. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's a pretty irresistible juxtaposition, um, you know, because there's no, it, it's difficult to read this book or honestly any other book in which Benedict Arnold plays a huge role and not think that it, much of what happened to him was his own fault. Right? I mean, some of yeah. the anecdotes in this, and I have a couple of bookmarks, but um, some of the anecdotes are pretty shocking, even though they're in 18th century <laughs> um, English. Um, you know, and, and just, I, you know, what your, your comments, Paul, made me think, and, and this book made me think, um, and then Char, we're going to come to you next, um, uh, that what Washington, like so much, there's so much discussion, and, and this is true of most books about the war for independence that they, they they sort of they hop from battle to battle because it's worse you know their books about a war and that's that's the sort of convention but really when you read when you read books like this what it becomes really obvious and uh i to me the thing that is most impressive about george washington is, is i mean honestly is organizational and personnel management skills i mean it seems like what he spent most of his time doing was writing letters to subordinates trying to get them to do things half of the time he was being ignored right um that's just you, you, it seems like he spent most of his time actually not fighting but just trying to move people from place to place and trying to communicate with people so that, that's what george washington uh, it gave me a new sort of renewed understanding of what george washington was actually good at right um we can debate whether or not he was good at as a commander right in battle um or if he was too aggressive or not, you know, 
that's those are worthy debates but he was he was excellent at managing people um and uh benedict arnold wasn't clearly uh, because he fought with every single person that he he worked closely with uh at least in the military um char uh, i think i saw you next so you please go right ahead and then we'll go over to uh jonathan or the screen that says jonathan marshall <laughs> all right that's that's my friend Terry Ann waving. So oh, cool. <laughs> that's you'll call on next. But um, <laughs> Michael, I did. I wanted to say two things. One, in support of your framing mm -hmm. of this as them being the inverse, and um, Paul supporting also what you said. It's Washington was a man who learned from his mistakes. Whether it was Jumonville, whether it was being out on the peninsula at Boston and thinking later about that at Yorktown, um, and Arnold. He learned from his successes. He was it, he seemed incapable of really learning from his mistakes. So there was some inverse relationship there too. But the other thing I think that really came out to me in the framing of these two in the book um, is really um, that uh, just that. Um, Oh my gosh, it flew out of my head. I'm going to come back with that one. <laughs> Can, did, okay, I'm just humble in saying that. I'm going to go go to Terry Ann and I'll raise my hand. Okay, again. happens to me all the time, yes. I promise. Uh, Terry Ann, you go ahead and Char, you, you can just jump right back in whenever you, you've remembered. Uh, can you go ahead and just mute, please, Terry? Yeah. That's might sound simplistic, but one of the contrasts that kept jumping out at me during the book um, was that it's one thing I think that's made uh, George Washington mythical um, and why uh, his myth has, um, you know, over you know previous years before current history was kind of being written was to make him mythical and almost like the American um, ultimate hero is that he had a conscience, he had a moral compass and when he lost his temper, uh, Philbert points that out towards the end. He didn't want to lose his temper again, like Kip Bay. You know, he 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 realized he accepts responsibility for when something doesn't go right. He also had a lot of heart. He cared about his men. He cared about their suffering. Um, he stayed with them. Benedict Arnold had no moral compass. He's uh, Philbert portrays him as a narcissist and an individual with no sense of guilt. He's never responsible for anything. It's all, it, as was pointed out, always takes somebody else's uh, view. It, towards the end of the book, points out, you know, reminding us how uh, Benedict Arnold just heartlessly shot the two horses. And, you know, George Washington loved his horse, took care of his <laughs> horse. And I think that that, 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 creates the man. I mean, George Washington had that book of his codes that he wrote down all these things were his personal codes of how he should behave that he referred to all the time. He, it was very important to him to have his personal code of behavior. And um, Benedict Arnold, you know, greed, money, that was his code. And uh, as I said, it might sound simplistic, but I think that really um, impacts how a person makes decisions, especially in a volatile situation like a revolutionary war. I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, and just for those of you who haven't read the book or, or aren't um, that familiar with some of the, the writing about Benedict Arnold, uh, Terry Annie described it perfectly, the way that Phil Brick describes Arnold, uh, traitor, treacherous, uh, all of the bad adjectives. Uh, and that is not, uh, uh, or I should say that that is very much uh, the the general the sort of prevailing wisdom about about Benedict Arnold. In, in other words, it's hard to read about his his uh, his life and not come away with that conclusion. And George Washington uh, was very much the opposite, as you mentioned, Terry Ann. Um, so, in other words, Philbrick doesn't exaggerate <laughs> the extent to which uh, Benedict Arnold was craven. Um, maybe is the right way to put it. Um, and I think it is their differences in their character uh, that are what, at, what sort of drive the heart of this book. And I might suggest, and then Char, sorry, I'm rambling on here, but um, uh, that he, he, Philbrick uses each of the, the, their, the characters of George Washington and Benedict Arnold to reflect the dual character of the American founding moment in general, which we can kind of return to as a sort of device for 
um, what scholars now call the, the first American Civil War. It was in fact the American Revolution, right? Uh, Char, go ahead then. Uh, no, I appreciate that comment you just made, Michael, a lot. Um, I think what I wanted to say too is that it, the juxtaposition and the way that he described both of them really heightens the betrayal of Arnold. It was a personal betrayal mm -hmm. after Washington was so um, already the Conway cabal, Gates go, I mean, you know, there were many people after him. Um, he was cautious, I think, about who he relied on. He knew that it was Arnold who saved him really at Saratoga and delivered that big win, we could argue saved us, right? Because then the French come in with Franklin. Um, and so to find that Arnold had done this um, and when he's up at the Robinson house and he says, um, Arnold has betrayed us, who can we trust now? You know, the we is America, but it's also him. Like, uh, so I think that the betrayal is also part of the relationship that Philbrick really draws out as he describes yeah. both of them. Yeah, I thanks, Char. That's really that's a poetic way of thinking about it. You know, and 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 again, what's so interesting is that um, he he managed to do to to evoke that those those almost feelings, right? But those he was able to to use their character differences uh, in multiple on multiple levels, if you will. Uh, and, you know, the irony is that they really didn't even spend that much time together. <laughs> I mean, in, in each other's actual presence, uh, just here and there, no extended periods of time. Um, well, thanks very much, Char. Uh, so um, there are, I'm just going to take a step back. We have a question in the Q&A, and I think, Dick, um, I'm going to let you ask that question in a second. I just want to refer, Judith, to your questions that are in the chat, uh, and the, or your comments, I should say. And the first one in particular, um, you know, because it sort of it ties back into this idea that, and I, I like the idea of thinking from the perspective of of Canada in this in this story, right? Because for obvious reasons, people from the United States tend to look from the perspective of the United States. When you look at the American Revolution from the perspective of Canada, um, uh, uh, or from the perspective of historians who are from Canada, the American Revolution is a very different, uh, a very different event with very different effects and very different consequences. Uh, and it and it just it's a reminder that you could think of the American Revolution as a continent wide civil war, right? If you include Canadians in it, and not just people living in the somewhat arbitrary geographical boundary of what is today the US Canada border and you think about it in terms of um, just a, a continent that was peopled with people it was a civil war. Uh, so uh, that's a really good comment. Thank you. An interesting comment. Thank you, Judith. Um, uh, Dick, did you want to uh, ask your question? It looked like you were uh, ready to do that. If, if uh, you want to go ahead. Oh, okay. Unable to connect with video. Dick, uh, I, you can still ask your question if you like, or uh, I can I can ask it for you. Um, either way is is uh, fine with me. Um, I can go ahead and, and, and begin reading it, and then we can think about it. Um, uh, so Dick's question, uh, if you hadn't had a chance to look at it, and the question is, um, uh, in Valiant Ambition, does Philbrick put too much emphasis uh, on Washington and Arnold as prime movers in deciding the fate of the American Revolution, uh, and therefore not enough emphasis on other factors, uh, like the will of the American patriots, the failures of British military strategy, uh, misguided policies on the part of Parliament in the British Crown, and and we could add a lot of others. So thank you. That's just the starters list. <laughs> um, that's a great question, Dick. Um, and I think uh, well, I'm curious to know to to hear your thoughts. Uh, I I certainly have thoughts. Um, I think he probably does, but I think he also decided. And this is pulling the curtain back a little bit, along with his publisher, that was a book that would sell really well is a book about George Washington and Benedict Arnold, because they are names that everybody sort of most people recognize, right? You know, it, it's, it's, it's Horatio Gates doesn't sell as many books, okay, as Benedict <laughs> Arnold do, does, okay, uh, even though, uh, as we know, he, he, he commanded Benedict Arnold. Um, so to a degree, that's just a product of a dual biography, right? Um, and it's true of any biography. Biographies always overstate, 
almost always overstate the significance of the person who's being written about because that's just the that's just the hazard of the field, and we just accept it, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, the question that you ask and the examples that you provide, Dick, are something that we can think about because I think that's a really interesting question, right? Uh, if we can accept that, there's probably it might be weird to say there's a little too much emphasis on George Washington, right? But not one per one person does not win a war. I mean, George Washington was obviously significant, but he was just one person. So if we can accept the basic proposition that yes, there's probably too much emphasis put on Benedict Arnold and George Washington as two individuals uh, and think about the other uh, things that might've been emphasized, right? That's an interesting, interesting question. And um, I can think of a couple that appear throughout this book that, uh, Phil Brick might have uh, emphasized as uh, key factors driving American independence movement. I can think of one big one, but I'm curious if, you, if any of you can think of anything um, off the top of your head. So I'm putting, you, putting you on the spot. <laughs> uh, yeah, the French. The French. The French. The French. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Right. So that's it. That's Without it. the French, this would not have worked. Right. Exactly. And I, I, I don't think Phil Brick would disagree with that, right? But he's writing a biography that's what he yeah. focuses on the two, right? Uh, that's definitely uh, uh, true. I definitely agree with that, Paul. Um, but if they use that as the cover of the book, The French in America, the people that think something with sex or drinks or something <laughs> other. And that's, and when I, I don't think of those words when I think of George Washington and Benedict Arnold. That's no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jim, did you, <laughs> I see your hand, Jim, and then... Uh, Jonathan Marshall or yeah okay so Jim go ahead please uh can you just go ahead and unmute so we can yeah thank you sorry uh, I'm also a history teacher at um, Memorial High School with Andy Scott uh oh. he got me in uh, really this is a really nice uh enjoyable forum I appreciate this um so I think I'm I'm a little bit in the minority in that uh, I, I, I have a lot of, at least early on, I have a lot of sympathy for Arnold. Um, I had, you know, you grow up with knowing that only he's the bad guy and he's this evil betrayer. Um, but especially even from this book, and I've been learning more uh, reading about him is of how much, uh, how much really, you know, loyalty, at least initially, he puts out uh, for the cause. Um, you know, and he reminded me a little bit of John Glover from Marblehead, Massachusetts, who who gave a lot of his own personal fortune um, toward, you know, investing in the revolution. Certainly start to see that it's for other maybe other ulterior motives. But, you know, here's a guy who in in, you know, I, it never says he never thinks to himself like, wait, if I get killed, all of this is going to be for nothing. He constantly puts himself in harm's way. He's going home to visit in Connecticut, and he hears that um, uh, Governor Tryon is leading this uh, attack on Ridgefield. And without even thinking, he's off to uh, you know to to stop them with any anything he can. You know, so um, and I look back and I say, wow, if if, if the founding fathers could look at the big picture now and look back, they may realize, wow, we had such a such a, a whirlwind of a general here, you know, if we could have harnessed him the right way, he would have been like a general Patton. Uh, you know, the, the British really feared him. He was a loose cannon, you know, um, and he really could have been, you know, had he been more appreciated, um, you know, and I think about at, at Saratoga, if he had died at Saratoga, we would be talking about him in a whole other way right now. He was, he would have been such a huge hero to the revolution. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it, you know, I, I kind of root and rooting for him. Right? And yeah, it's amazing. No military experience, how he's just doing all this. So I didn't even know about the whole part about how, how involved he was with Lake Champlain. It's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. He's, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. I mean, he's, you know, I, I like your comparison to Patton because that's one that jumps to my mind too. And, and, and then when you think about it, you, uh, what a horrible idea it would have been if Patton had been the president, right? He's perfectly fine <laughs> yeah. as a general. Keep him out in the battlefield. Not, we don't need Patton uh, with his hand on the, the button uh, <laughs> as the president. Um, Ma there... Michael, can I throw in one thing sure. there? Go ahead. I had to write a paper on Patton for a war college type thing. 
Patton was actually a very smart cookie. Uh, he, yeah, no, I, I agree with Jim saying though. He used to get up in the morning and put on his war face, quote unquote. He, he a lot of that was an act that he, rah, 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 but he also lost his temper. Smacking people was a no no. Uh, if as an officer, I, God help us if I even spit near anyone's, you're in trouble. Uh, Patton was a very smart guy. He, 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 he worked, I'm not going to go into all that of analyzing his tactics and everything else, but he was not suited to be a supreme commander. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was. Montgomery was a smart guy. He would have been terrible as a supreme commander. <laughs> and that, that I think is one of the things that um, Benedict Arnold was a superb combat general. You're absolutely right. Uh, he didn't need training. He didn't mean anything. He jumped out to the Civil War. Nathan Forrest was a brilliant general. He never had any education, but not a supreme commander. I go with what Michael said. It's a very interesting point. Washington spent an inordinate amount of time on personal matters, on writing things, on hitting up Congress, da 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 da. That's what most guys with four stars on their shoulders end up doing. Um, it, there's a lot of administrative stuff in there. Uh, I had one tell me once, some of the fellows want to have this big job, <laughs> would not want it if they knew how much time I spent squabbling with people about problems. No, it's, it's, it's not this out in the front all the time stuff. So I think Jim is right, though. I mean, yeah. Ar Arnold come across, it comes across rather as what we think of George Patton and a force of nature. Uh, there were other four, I, Philbrick even calls uh, John Stark a force of nature. He would not have been good at Supreme for leading a, a large thing. I think one of the great things about wa Washington is he was able to balance all these. And I think it was Shar who said he grew and learned from his mistakes. He didn't make a second mistake. Very rarely did he make the same mistake the second time. Uh, Arnold just went charging off. I, I agree with Jim. Uh, years ago, I wrote an article for a newspaper about praising Benedict Arnold. If he hadn't been so good, the supposed, the attempted treachery would not have been so earth shaking. Well, I think that's an interesting point, right? That, and this, you know, this makes me think of Sarah, I'm reading your comment on, uh, in the chat. So I want to say that I agree with you, but this is the point that the reason I agree with you, which is that it, it and I think uh, at this point was made not too long ago as well. Um, it's, it's the, it, 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 the reason why the betrayal hurts so badly, I think I'm thinking of your, co your comment, Char, earlier. The reason the betrayal hurts so badly is because how important Benedict was important yeah. to mention that. You know, and it's worth mentioning, Jim, your, your comment uh, also brought up, to, yeah. just reminded me of the fact that most people don't realize you know, Benedict Arnold is a byword for traitor, <laughs> right? We use it as a synonym for traitor now. Most people don't realize that he gave uh, pretty much everything he had to the cause, right? Financially, it lost everything. You know, most people don't realize he's basically, uh, he was basically uh, demobilized, not basically, he was demobilized. He, both of his, one leg was broken twice in two different spots, one in the tibia, one in the femur by rifle bullets. He couldn't walk at the end of his life. All of this because he gave his life, almost gave his entire life uh, on the battlefield to the cause, right? Uh, so th there's no question that B Benedict Arnold had um, uh, given almost everything he had before he decided to commit treason. Uh, and there's no doubt about that, nor is there any doubt of his courage on the battlefield. There's, there's zero doubt about that. His intelligence on the battlefield, quite a bit of doubt. Um, in any case, uh, I, Jonathan Marshall's on the screen, but you have your, your hand up. So, and then Bob Fitanzi will go over to you. So that'll, that'll be our order. Um. No, thank you. Um, I would have looked also, as you were mentioning, the different Supreme Commander mm -hmm. versus the Patton. You know, look at a George Marshall, uh, who was figuring out the strategy, because you had Washington trying to figure out the strategy, do the administrative work, right. and uh, fight a battle. Because um, he, the advice uh, he was getting from the Continental Congress wasn't being helpful. Uh, you can make the same case probably for the for what the uh, the British uh, uh, the, the, you know uh, War Department was sending to 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 Howe and to you know uh, to Clinton later on uh, wasn't being helpful either. But I, I think also one of the points I think I was going to mention earlier was just the the, the timing. Mm -hmm. um, I look at the mutiny in 1780 
uh, you know, you sort of sort of forget that that was how late that was, uh, and that could have that could have changed everything also. Uh, if that uh, mutiny had continued uh, and wasn't put down. Um, and then the, the character you said who, you know, you, you asked for another person, I think definitely the French were the people that were hopefully going to be present, but were never present uh, mm -hmm. until, until they absolutely needed to be present at Yorktown. But uh, Joseph Plum Martin was everywhere. Uh, <laughs> and I think the, I think someone, I think they described him as the Zelig. Uh, and he was. <laughs> and, and I think where you, you finish off with, um, Martin uh, working on the, the siege strategy, uh, which was interesting that uh, George Washington, God bless him to the bitter end, was still gonna figure out a way to attack uh, New York uh, if he needed to. But I think he won't, but I think that was, so he was doing a lot of different, trying to keep those ball, different balls in the air. And uh, uh, that, that was impressive on that. Uh, but you look at, um, trying to enrich themselves as we were to uh, further discussion of uh, Benedict Arnold. No, he, did he get appreciated as, as, as he should have? No. Uh, Nathaniel Green, uh, if he had gotten what he probably deserved uh, after Fort Washington, uh, we wouldn't have seen uh, Nathaniel Green again, nor would we have seen him as the uh, quartermaster who he did have the sense uh, not a good sense in a way, but uh, uh, I guess a, a, a saving sense for his uh, reputation of not explaining the very nice commission that he was making on all the goods that he was uh, s uh, processing uh, for the um, uh, for the military. And uh, Arnold, you know, was too bombastic about it and, and never, never thoughtful, and I think, uh, certainly. The, the narcissist uh, who had to be the center of attention. I think Char's point was great. He, he, learned, he learned from his successes, but he didn't learn to write lessons necessarily that what made it a success and what made a failure a failure. Um, he thought everything he did was, was perfect. Um, and, uh, not, you know, uh, and I, I think that's something that uh, Washington very much figured out where he tried to control his temper because I mean, if we if we were going to throw out uh, generals for their temper, we'd have very few generals. There'd be no generals. <laughs> there wouldn't be any would there. <laughs> we'd have none. If there were any, uh, Eisenhower had a pretty good temper too. I I understand. Oh yeah. <laughs> you brought up Nathaniel Green, who I love to hear about. He's not well known, but uh, as a Thomas Paine uh, biographer. Uh, I love to hear Green because uh, Payne served as his secretary on on uh, campaign for a little while. Uh, but you know, you also brought up a couple of other things. One smaller one, you know, war profiteering uh, continues, <laughs> and it's always happened in the past. You noted that, oh. but you brought up something. You, you, in a way, you kind of stole my thunder, but I love that because this is it was an amazing comment, and I and I just want to sort of point it out now. And we're getting close. We had about fifteen minutes left, so this has been really exciting. <coughs> You brought up Joseph Plum Martin, and he's an interesting figure. Uh, and um, I, I was going to mention, and, and I'll just say it now, you know, in, in thinking about that question that I posed earlier about, and it was really a comment that I made that was based off of a, uh, one of Dick's comments, uh, which was the question about overemphasizing uh, George Washington and Benedict Arnold. And I sort of, you know, as you remember, partially said, well, you know, they, he was contracted to write a dual biography. So that's what happens. Okay. That's true. Right. But uh, on the other hand, you know, this book, what, what would this book look like? Or another, another way of stating this is what would this history look like if the central figure was, if you swapped out Joseph Plum Martin for, for Benedict Arnold, right? So a private who's, who is the one that's suffering through all of these, all of these uh, uh, drudger, you know, days of drudge, uh, and interlaced with frightening fear of dying, right, in the middle of a battle with the British, and who's sitting there in Kipps Bay, and is the last line of defense while ten thousand British troops <laughs> are uh, two hundred yards away, right, uh, and it's just popping up in all these different places. What would that look like? So another way of stating that is that this is a very traditional kind of biography because it looks at two elite white men and follows them, uh, and of course their names that we know. Washington and Arnold, but that is what this book is, uh, and it's traditional in that way, right? Well, what if you wrote a history of this time period, and, and, and Joseph Plum Martin was at the center of the story, 
it would be very different and it would be it would be different for a lot of reasons um uh and i think that that's a way of sort of approaching the war for independence um but as a lived experience i mean we get plenty of a lived experience of george washington and benedict arnold right but from the pers from their perspective they looked top down on everything that they surveyed and in many cases they were literally standing on the tops of hills surveying everything that they could see right george joseph Plum martin's in the middle of it right he's at the bottom in the scrum uh, and that's just a way of uh, a sort of way of if you sort of flip that framework i think that's a really interesting way to sort of approach a book like this right which is traditional in many ways um now that was my response so thank you very much for bringing up joseph Plum martin who uh, i just will add one more one more thought is somebody who's famous to historians uh because he's one of the few people who was not an elite to leave a lengthy diary and journal in which he recorded uh, his actions uh, so he's one of the few uh, pieces of surviving evidence that's extensive from somebody who wasn't an elite. So that's why he's famous to me. And I know Nora will know who he is too, because you read a lot of books from this time period. It's like when you need the perspective of the private, then you go use Joseph Plum Martin's diary because it's lengthy. And um, uh, we all know him, if you will, uh, even though, of course, we don't know. Him. Uh, so um, I'm just going to take a look at the Q&A. Okay, Donald, um, this is an interesting question, Donald, and you had your hand up earlier too, so I'm glad we're getting to, uh, to, to address this one. Uh, if two books were written on Arnold, uh, interesting, one, knowing, not knowing that the treason would happen, uh, and the other, knowing that the treason would happen, uh, you would think he's two different, you would think Benedict Arnold is two different people. Uh, we must take history, take care to read history as it occurred and not how it ended. Uh, my favorite t-shirt displays the words Benedict Arnold was a war hero too, which he was. Uh, his life after the revolution continues to be stuff successful novels are written about. Um, and, it's, and so in this book, um, Philbert doesn't really tell us what happened to Arnold, right? Um, and I don't want to go into the, to the story uh, too long because we only have a few minutes left, but that's an interesting comment. And it's it's true of, I, I think, actually, every work of history that I read, I, I think about a version of your comment, uh, Donald, which is that approaching a uh, historical subject, um, thinking retrospectively, or in other words, sometimes historians like to use a telescope uh, analogy, right? But if you, if you look back to the past through the small end of the telescope, then you'll magnify what you're looking for in the past, and you'll ignore context, uh, is another way of putting that. Uh, and so that's a reminder, right? Um, Benedict Arnold didn't know he was going to commit treason, okay, until, as we learned from this book, only a couple of weeks before he actually did it, right? Uh, so why would we think about uh, a, a history of his life uh, at the outset knowing that he was going to commit treason? He didn't realize that that's what he was going to do until a pretty late, late period. Um, so that's a really interesting comment. Um, Bob, sorry, uh, I rambled a little bit, but... <coughs> And if you could just, uh, yeah, thanks. No, that's fine. Um, just my initial comment actually was, was about the fact that this book is also about ego. Uh -huh. Both Ben McDonald and George Washington had tremendous egos. I mean, they wouldn't have been able to do what they did if they didn't. Um, what's, what's interesting is, is the difference in sort of what their egos led them to. I mean, comments were made earlier about uh, George Washington having a moral compass and, and Benedict Arnold not. So, you know, sort of the two sides of ego, if you will. Mm -hmm. The other point, and, and, and it, it goes into the, the, um, the Joseph Plum Martin um, comments are, okay, so if we accept their egos as being responsible for, for mm -hmm who they were and why they were there. I mean, the comment was made earlier about why did Benedict Arnold throw himself into the forefront? Well, my read is that, you know, he was, he saw himself as this, this larger than life figure and this, that was what he needed to do. But what were the, the people like Joseph Plum Martin getting out of it? Yeah. You know, what, what was their payoff? They didn't become Supreme Commander. They didn't become, you know, renowned and, um, you know, 
toasted generals. You know, so what, what was their payoff? So, I, you know, I think that's, for me, you know, that's a part that, that needs to be explored. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, because when you read books like this, and this is one of the best things, well, one of Phil Vick's strengths is the amount of detail that he can unearth, right, when he's describing, uh, you know, troop, things that are sort of dreary, like troop mobilizations, right, which for the obvious reasons of technological differences between now and the 18th century took forever, right? Took armies a really long time to go places and there was constant worrying about how much food they would have to eat and George Washington could never communicate with any of his generals and they kept blowing <laughs> him off, right? Um, so when you look at it again, you know, as you point out, Bob, right, from the perspective of somebody like Joseph Plum Martin, like that, what what does that history sound like? It's, it's It has nothing to do with the ego of George Washington and wanting to, you know, or the ego of Benedict Arnold and, and constantly wanting to make the biggest possible metaphorical military splash that you can, right? Much of what the war for independence looks like is a boring, dirty, like mess, basically, right? If you look at it from the perspective of Joseph Plum Martin, uh, not to be too blunt, but the war kind of sucks, right? <laughs> um, and then what did they get out? What did they get out of it? Uh, what did Joseph Plum Martin get out of it? Well, uh, he got uh, 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 it took him years, uh, like many other continental soldiers, to receive their back pay. They received it in continental dollars, which were uh, basically worthless. They were so worthless that soldiers would use their continental dollars as wallpaper because they couldn't afford wallpaper. So they would paper their houses with their, the money that they got paid that was worthless. <laughs> Uh, they got depression, they got, <laughs> uh, over time, most Revolutionary War veterans were able to set, stabilize. But I mean, one of the things we don't remember when we talk about the American Revolution, and this gets back to something I, I mentioned at the very beginning of our, our, our event here, it's usually mythologizes the American Revolution, that is, it's, it's not being that bloody when compared to other revolutions. It's oh. usually compared to the French Revolution. Uh, or not as violent as certainly like World War One, right, or World War Two, right, um, and, and and therefore by comparison, sort of orderly and kind of um, uh, worth celebrating, worth venerating that the American Revolution wasn't that violent, uh, and that's a sort of myth that carried down through the 19th and early 20th centuries mm -hmm. through the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and when you read books like this, it, you realize how violent it was, but not in a way that we're used to thinking about military violence in the context of massive pitched battles. There weren't that many in the American Revolution. This is day-to-day -day violence in places like Westchester County, right? How did uh, John Andre get captured? He got captured by three American militia members. Why were they out there? Because uh, the Cowboys and the Skinners were out there, the outlaws patriot and loyalist outlaws who were robbing people and stabbing them left and right. This is day-to-day -day violence. Um, and I think that is uh, a strength of this book. And for somebody like Joseph Plum Martin, day-to-day -day violence was his experience of the American Revolution. Yeah, that's a very good point. Wars are inherently violent. <laughs> and when they're not violent, they're boring. They're boring, right? Yeah. They're boring. It's a yeah. lot of sitting around doing nothing and figuring what are we going to do and blah, blah, blah. Right. Oh my God, here comes someone. And then there's intense periods of extreme violence with right. the intent of killing. Right, right. That's, that's not a great way to live. <laughs> no, I mean, when you, you if, if one, and you can sort of do that in this book, um, if you sort of look just at the maps and you kind of follow them chronologically, um, what you see is it, it, it basically boiled down to, if you're looking at it from the, the ordinary soldier's perspective, marching back and forth, seemingly, almost seeming from march to one place, and then I go back to where I came from, and then I march back to the place I came from, and then I march back to the place that I came from that I came from. Right? Just a lot of mobilizations to, to seemingly no end. <coughs> um, so anyway, I, I, I don't think we have any more. Andrew, did you have one last comment that you want to get in? Good, go ahead, please. And just one last thing. I know our time is uh, winding up, but uh, one of the things I think whenever you study Benedict Arnold, uh, the important question that comes up is um, the role of Peggy Shippen. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> would, in, and there's no way for us to answer this, but would, uh, would Arnold have chosen not only just to, to side with the British, but he actively fought on the British side in the last few years of the war, and he actively sought to undermine these men he used to work with. But would he have taken that step 
had he married someone else <laughs> or had or had her father said no i don't want to you know did she i mean she played a big role in facilitating that treason but would he have taken that step without that and, and I know we don't really have an answer to it, but I think it, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing we can use when thinking about um, the power and influence of women in a time where they didn't officially have power and influence. It's a good question. Right, so that, it's a good way. question. Be careful who you're marrying. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that brings up one, one point worth making. Thanks, Andrew. One point worth making, and, and this is just a sort of general statement, but, um, you know, this, one of, one of the, the sort of, weaknesses of this book is the fact that uh, this is a very male-centric book and part of the reason why is because it's a military history book and and um, much of it is basically following armies around on the road uh, on the campaign well first of all uh, 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 military forces in this time period were not uh, they're, they're very different than they are today uh, there were large numbers of camp followers and this wasn't uh, this sometimes sort of said that um, camp followers were uh, sex workers, and most of them were family members of soldiers. So soldiers' families could travel with the army at this time, which now, of course, we when they're on campaign, and now, of course, we know that that's not possible. Families don't mobilize with soldiers. But but all of that is to say that women play a relatively little role in this book, and I think that if you asked a women's historian, a historian of women's experience uh, about this book, they would say, well, you know, its biggest weakness, which I agree with, is that this is all white men doing stuff, right? And and the only woman who has any kind of agency is Peggy Shippen, right? Who, as you mentioned, Andrew, plays the sort of, the, the kind of caricature role that um, she plays in most histories, which is that she's the beautiful, I accidentally got unmuted. She's a beautiful woman who, um, who steers Benedict Arnold towards treason, right? But you know, of course, we know that um, women played crucial roles. So that's just one thing I'll say. Um, Dick, uh, we'll go to you and then Linda, I think. Um, so, and then I think those might be our last two questions. So go ahead, uh, Dick. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. go ahead, Dick. Oh, yeah. Um, I just want to say what, what a great uh, discussion we had. Uh, I just want to make one point. Uh, Westchester, especially Lower Westchester, suffered as much as any area in the colonies and perhaps longer. And this is something that um, you, you were alluding to the, uh, the violence of the American Revolution. And you know, having been teaching uh, the American Revolution since 1966, the general public doesn't appreciate how much we suffered and the sacrifices that the ordinary men, women, enslaved people um, uh, from different perspectives um, had in Lower Westchester. And, and as we get closer to the 250th, I, th I think this is part of our mission to, to make the, the school children and the general public aware of what we did from multiple perspectives. Yeah, thanks. Dick. I mean, that, that's uh, that's a great point. And you know, a lot of the histories of the American Revolution, they they kind of skip over our, our Westchester area, and and that would be um, a mistake if uh, you ask the people who lived through it <laughs> in that time period. Um, so, Linda, did you want to go ahead, and then Bob? I think you might have a follow up, and then I think those might be our last two. So, Linda, please. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, I just want to say, first of all, that I really love the book, and I thank the person who chose it, and I was quite so surprised how it read like a narrative, like it, like almost like a novel uh, through a lot of it, even though, of course, you had to deal with the wars, that the battles that were occurring, uh, etc. So, um, and I'd own, the, I'd own the book, and I read little parts of it, but it, it's just very different to read it from the beginning. Um, I wanted to comment on the and early on, we were talking about the framework and why the mm -hmm. author chose this framework with, with um, Arnold and, and Washington. And I think, I think the purpose of the author was to, um, you know, valiant ambition. I think his purpose was to get to the betrayal and to, and, to, and, to, and to back up to an early part and to build as to how this betrayal came about. And I mean, the betrayal was a personal betrayal of Washington as much as it was of the revolution, um, you know, he gave he gave the British. He, Washington's going to be crossing the river. Go nab him! 
I mean, that would have been so hideous. <laughs> and um, so it, so there was this, this very personal element. And here, Washington trusted him so much. And, um, uh, you know, when I read the beginning of this book, I, 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 I got a totally different perspective of Arnold, uh, you know, his good side. And so I think he's, he, he, the, the author's intention, what my guess of the author's intention was, he was going to tell these parallel stories of Washington at this part of the war, Arnold at this part of the war, and how this developed. Um, and, and, and that's why he ends it where, where he did, which is the denouement is, uh, is the, the end of the betrayal and not the end of the war. So, yeah. Anybody, yeah, no, hey. yeah, that's a really interesting point. Connie, that, you know, I, I referred to your question. That was sort of your question that you'd emailed me a, a couple of days ago, right? That's a version yeah. of it. Um, and I think that's an interesting point. Yeah, I mean, um, one thing that he manages to do is humanize Benedict Arnold, which is sometimes not easy to do because it, a lot of the sources he leaves behind, you're just astounded by the guy's ego. Uh, uh, there, was a, there was a mention of ego earlier. Uh, it's hard to imagine how anybody liked him, <laughs> but you know, he manages to humanize him. And I think that's important. Um, I guess this is our, our last question. Um, that was a great summary, Linda. Uh, thank you. Uh, is Bob, you have the honors. All right, thank you. Okay, I just, it's not really a question. I just wanted to make a point that um, one of the major um, initiatives of RW250 is This Man's a Spy, which is um, a, an attempt to um, explore the whole issue of Arnold and Andre and, and to tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. So for anyone who's interested in volunteering and, and learning more, um, you can go to the RW250 uh, website and uh, or Facebook uh, page, and there's a, a section on um, this man's a spy, and you can learn more information and hopefully volunteer. Well, that thanks, Bob, very much. That's a perfect way to end it. Um, Connie, did you have something you wanted to add? Um, I I have just been listening to all these comments and. Um, your uh, very professional way of handling uh, <laughs> this, Michael, um, makes me really happy that we have this partnership with, with you and Nora and um, the Institute for Thomas Paine Studies. I am glad we have all these volunteers who can help pick the next book for sure. I had I have a lot of thoughts on this, but you know my thoughts uh, um, are that it was a great page turner and some uh, assumptions and big ideas that probably uh, were happy that for the publisher, <laughs> but maybe a little less supported by the hard, hard work of historians. So um, I would, this could go on for another hour, but I know we are going to end. So I know we're gonna do another one. Uh, anybody can be in touch with, us, rw250.org is the website, and volunteer to help think of some other books and be part of, maybe in June, we'll do another one. Uh, Char, uh, Linda, many of you, Bob, uh, great, great comments. Dick, thank you all. So I'm happy to say goodbye. And uh, anybody else, uh, Nora or Michael, feel free to end it. <laughs> I'll just say quickly, thanks very much, everybody, for spending some time with us on Sunday. This has been great. And uh, Connie, sign me up for the next one. Um, okay. <laughs> and send Connie your ideas for books, yeah. uh, for different titles, because uh, okay. this is fantastic. Thanks, every thanks very yeah. much, everybody, for being with us. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much.